This is the magic of this experience that we're all having here on Earth. This is the magic of what it means to be human. This is the magic of what it of what Christmas means. This is the joy, the true, mysterious, sacred joy of Christmas. Welcome back to another episode of Daily Neville. I am your host, Josiah Brandt, and Daily Neville is all about breaking down the teachings of Neville Goddard, making them easy to understand, easy to digest, easy to apply, in 20 minutes or less. Today we are continuing with Neville's famous book, Your Faith is Your Fortune, and this is a very special chapter. This is the chapter that is all about the esoteric secret of Christmas. Now, Christmas has been one of my favorite holidays for a long time. And that is in part because of just all of the pageantry that goes into Christmas. I love the lights, I love the decorations. I love the sentiment of it. I love getting together with family. I love the routine of it. I love the holiday aspect of it. But really, when I discovered the teachings of Neville Goddard and began to unravel the mystic, more esoteric or inner hidden meaning of Christmas, the holiday became so much more beautiful to me. And rather than just kind of celebrating it because that's just what we do in my culture, it's just a tradition that I just uphold because the people that came before me did it and I want you know my kids to have the same experience. Rather than being in that perspective, it has started to develop a very sacred, special inner meaning for me. And my goal with this episode is to illuminate through the words of Neville, but also by shedding some additional light on Neville's words, exactly what it is about Christmas that I find to be so special. And I'm hoping that you will catch the mood of the magic of Christmas as well. And and that this holiday will become much more special for you, something that you can appreciate in an even deeper, more inner way, in addition to all of the other ways that you celebrate this holiday as well. So that being said, let's go ahead and dive right in. Matthew 123. Behold, A virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which, being interpreted, is God with us. One of the most controversial statements in the New Testament concerns the virgin conception and subsequent birth of Jesus, a conception in which man had no part. It is recorded that a virgin conceived a son without the aid of man. Then, secretly and without effort, gave birth to her conception. This is the foundation upon which all Christendom rests. Now, what Neville means when he says that this is the foundation upon which all Christendom rests, the whole Christian world or the whole religion of Christianity, which Neville terms Christendom, you call that the kingdom of Christianity rests upon the foundation of the virgin birth. It's this idea that Jesus Christ was special. Jesus was special because he was born to a woman who was a virgin. She had not known a man, and yet she gave birth to a son. And the story, the way the story is told is that it was the Holy Spirit that conceived this child within this woman, and she gave birth to this child. And we all knew that this child was special because this child had no earthly father, Now, this begins the esoteric or inner hidden meaning of Christmas right here. This is a state or quality. Jesus Christ is a state or quality of consciousness that is born without an earthly father. It is born with a father that is not of the earth. Okay, so this begins even just in the the way that the story is told. Immediately, it begins to convey a deeper hidden inner meaning. And naturally, as what Neville is saying here, all of Christianity rests upon this idea that Jesus was special in some way. Because if Jesus isn't special, if he's not the Savior, then we have no basis for the religion of Christianity. Let's continue with Neville's words. The Christian world, Neville writes, is asked to believe this story. For man must believe the unbelievable to fully express the greatness that he is. What a quote. Man must believe the unbelievable to fully express the greatness that he is. 
This is one of those knockout quotes that Neville delivers. Neville really being the Shakespeare of mystics. He can, in a sentence, just deliver this knockout punch of a man must believe the unbelievable to fully express the greatness that he is. We must go beyond the realm of the known if we are ever to tap in to our fullest potential. Scientifically, Neville writes, man might be inclined to discard the whole Bible as untrue because his reason or logic will not permit him to believe that the virgin birth is physiologically possible. But the Bible is a message of the soul and must be interpreted psychologically if man is to discover its true symbology. Man must see this story of Christmas as a psychological drama rather than as a statement of physical fact. In so doing, he will discover the Bible to be based on a law, which, if self-applied, will result in a manifested expression transcending his wildest dreams of accomplishment. Okay, so the Bible is based on a law that if you apply it to yourself, if you apply this law to yourself, in your own awareness of being, in your own consciousness, in your own life, it will result in an expression that exceeds and even transcends your wildest dreams of accomplishment. Now, when we use the word accomplishment, we think a lot about this earthly terms of success, which, of course, the Bible is very clear that earthly success means nothing in the world of, of God. It, earthly success is, I mean, earth is but a shadow, or the earth is a, a minor experience in the major realm of things. And so, you know, all of these treasures that we lay up for us on earth mean nothing. You know, we cannot bring our earthly tre treasures with us to heaven, is, is the way that the Bible would speak of this. So the Bible is constantly talking about there being a higher purpose and how earthly accomplishment is not the point. And what Neville is saying here is that the Bible is actually revealing a law. And if we apply this law to ourselves, it results in an expression that transcends even our wildest dreams of earthly accomplishment. And that is, as we know, from all of this time that we have invested, all this value that we've received from going deep into these works, we know that this transcending idea that we have the opportunity to express that transcends all of our earthly ideas of human accomplishment is, of course, the birth of God or the gift of God or the gift of consciousness, the gift of the Father to us, in us, for us, and with us. And of course, that's exactly how this Christmas story starts. The virgin will be with child, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. And Emmanuel translates to God with us. And that is the esoteric secret. That is exactly what the Bible is communicating to us, that there is a bigger play happening over the earthly scenes. You know, the earthly scenes of the script that we play out in our daily life. There's actually an overarching hero's journey happening here. And it is regards the birth of God in us that God is with us. To apply this law of self-expression, Neville writes, man must be schooled in the belief and disciplined to stand upon the platform that all things are possible to God. Schooled and disciplined. Okay, so let's take a review right now. Are we schooling ourselves in the belief that all things are possible to God? Through this daily Neville, we absolutely are. If you're coming back and you're watching this every single day and you're feeding your awareness, you're feeding your consciousness, this high vibe consciousness nutrition, you are schooling yourself in the belief that all things are possible to God. The second part of this equation is discipline. Are we disciplining our hearing? Are we disciplining our seeing? Are we disciplining our believing? Are we disciplining our being to be in this platform, to stand upon this platform, that all things are possible to God? What does it look like to discipline our awareness in this way? We're going to go so much deeper into these ideas as we continue. But for now, coming back to Neville. Neville writes, The outstanding dramatic dates of the New Testament, namely the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus, were timed and dated to coincide with certain astronomical phenomena. The mystics who recorded this story 
noticed that at certain seasons of the year, beneficial changes on Earth coincided with astronomical changes above. In writing this psychological drama, they have personified the story of the soul as the biography of man. So Jesus, the Bible, New Testament in particular, could be considered a biography of Jesus. And so that was a tool that the mystics who wrote the Bible used to personify the story of the soul. So the story of Jesus is the story of the soul. And it's veiled in the biography of a man, so it appears to be history. It's not intended to be physical history. It's intended to be psychological or divine history. Using these cosmic changes, and he's talking about how the times of year that the mystics wrote this story, you know, they set it in a, in a time and a place, and the times were set to coincide with these greater rhythms, patterns, and cycles. And this is part of how they encoded into the teachings the truth about what the teachings were truly about. The, the esoteric or inner hidden secrets of the teachings are also encoded in the way that the story is told. In this case, he's talking about how you know certain seasons of the year, certain things happen on earth, celestial cycles, and they're marking the birth and resurrection of Jesus to convey that the same changes, the beneficial changes, which take place psychologically in the man of in the consciousness of man as he follows the law, are very similar or related, or a mirror of, a mirror with the astronomical and physical and earth changes that occur every single year. And this is that renewing of, of the spirit of hope that Neville's about to talk about here. Using these cosmic changes, they have marked the birth and resurrection of Jesus to convey that the same beneficial changes take place psychologically in the consciousness of man as he follows this law. Even to those who fail to understand it, the story of Christmas is one of the most beautiful stories ever told. When unfolded in the light of its mystic symbology, it is revealed as the true birth of every manifestation in the world. This virgin birth is recorded as having taken place on December 25th, or as certain secret societies date it, or celebrate it on Christmas Eve, at midnight of December 24th. Mystics established this date to mark the birth of Jesus because it was in keeping with the great earthly benefits this astronomical change signifies. Now, he keeps talking about astronomical changes, and he's about to explain exactly what he means by this. The astronomical observations which prompted the authors of this drama to use these dates were all made in the Northern Hemisphere. So, from an astronomical point of view, the reverse would be true if seen from the Southern Latitudes. However, this story was recorded in the North and therefore was based on Northern observation. Man, very early, discovered that the sun played a most important part in his life, that without the sun, physical life as he knew it could not be. So these most important dates in the story of the life of Jesus are based upon the position of the sun, as seen from the earth in the northern latitudes. After the sun reaches its highest point in the heavens in June, it gradually falls southward, taking with it the life of the plant world, so that by December, all, almost all of nature has been stilled. Should the sun continue to fall southward, all nature would be stilled unto death. However, on December 25th, the sun begins its great move northward, bringing with it the promise of salvation and life anew for the world. Each day, as the sun rises higher in the heavens, man gains confidence in being saved from death by cold and starvation. For he knows that as it moves northward and crosses the equator, all nature will rise again, will be resurrected from its long winter sleep. This reminds me of my favorite Christmas song, which is, O Holy Night. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices, for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Fall on your knees, hear the angels, O night divine. Such a beautiful representation of the hope that is born in us when we become aware 
that we are truly free. We have the truth that sets us free and it's all within us. We don't have to go to another. We are never subservient to another. We can own our own power. And to me, that is that thrill of hope. Maybe the causation of my life is not outside of me. Maybe I'm not a victim. Maybe I can be a victor. Maybe I can overcome that thrill of hope. The weary world, the weary world that is worried that it's going to die from cold and starvation. That's the wilderness. That's the desert. How many people in this modern world in which we live are living in a desert? How many people in this modern world in which we live have given away their power to the extent where they have no power left, where they feel they're in a state where they feel like they have no power left? That's never the truth. But how many people are in that weary world state? And then the thrill of hope. The weary world rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. This is the magic of this experience that we're all having here on earth. This is the magic of what it means to be human. This is the magic of what, it, of what Christmas means. This is the joy, the true, mysterious, sacred joy of Christmas. Continuing with Neville's words. Our day is measured from midnight to midnight. And since the visible day begins in the east and ends in the west, the ancients said the day was born of that constellation which occupied the eastern horizon at midnight. On Christmas Eve, or midnight of December 24th, the constellation Virgo is rising on the eastern horizon. So it is recorded that this sun and savior of the world was born of a virgin. It is also recorded that this virgin mother was traveling through the night, that she stopped at an inn and was given the only available room among the animals, and there in a manger, where the animals fed, the shepherds found the holy child. The animals with whom the holy virgin was lodged are the holy animals of the zodiac. There, in that constantly moving circle of astronomical animals, stands the holy mother, Virgo. And there you will see her every midnight of December 24th, standing on the eastern horizon as the sun and savior of the world starts his journey northward. Now, psychologically, this birth takes place in man on the day when man discovers his consciousness to be the sun and savior of his world. When man knows the significance of this mystical statement, I am the light of the world, he will realize that his I am, or his consciousness, is the sun of his life, which sun radiates images upon the screen of space. These images are in the likeness of that which he, as man, is conscious of being. Thus, qualities and attributes which appear to move on the screen of his world, are really projections from this light within himself. The numberless unrealized hopes and ambitions of man are the seeds which are buried within the consciousness or virgin womb of man. There they remain like seeds of the earth, held in the frozen waste of winter, waiting for the sun or our awareness to move northward, or for man to return to the knowledge of who he is. In returning, he moves northward through recognition of his true self by claiming, I am the light of the world. When man discovers his consciousness or I am to be God, the savior of the world, of his world, he will be as the sun in its northern passage. All hidden urges and ambitions will then be warmed and stimulated into birth by this knowledge of his true self. He will claim that he is that which he heretofore had hoped to be. Without the aid of any man, without the aid of anyone outside of yourself, you will define yourself as that which you desire to express. You will discover that your I am is the virgin conceiving without the aid of another, that all conceptions of yourself 
when felt and fixed in consciousness, will be embodied easily as living realities in your world. You will one day realize that this whole drama takes place in your consciousness, that your unconditioned consciousness, or I am, is the Virgin Mary desiring to express that through this law of self-expression, you define yourself as that which you desire to express, and that without the help or cooperation of anyone, you will express that which you have consciously claimed and defined yourself as being. You will then understand why Christmas is fixed on December 25th, while Easter is a movable date. Why upon the virgin conception, the whole of Christendom rests. That your consciousness is the virgin womb or the bride of the Lord, receiving impressions as self-impregnations, and then, without assistance, embodying these impressions as the expressions of your life. This is just the beginning of this exploration of Christmas, and I feel there's so much that could be said here about this sacred, mystical holiday. And uh, this chapter has really just scratched the surface. The lore of this holiday is so revealing. And when you begin to open your eyes to see behind the veil of the traditions, you see that this esoteric mystic secret is everywhere. It is literally layered and plastered and just strewn all throughout all of the traditions associated with this holiday. The Christmas songs, I shared one with you earlier. Sorry, I didn't sing it. Maybe next time. Christmas songs absolutely layered with incredible mystic truth, sacred revelations that were these songs, so many of them, not, not every single one of them, but so many of them that I found once I started to have my the veil pulled back from my eyes and began to see the truth. So many of them were clearly written by enlightened mystics. These Christmas songs, these Christmas carols, were clearly written by people who had had the experience and were aware of the truth of the secret of being, the truth of this law, the truth of this law being revealed to us in these episodes of Daily Neville. That's all for this one. In the next, we're going to continue to dive into these sacred esoteric secrets we're going to talk about the crucifixion and the resurrection and what this means for you and I in our world. Until then, imagine wisely, my friends, and I'll see you in the next.